All right. Hello, everybody. I am Martha Alter Hines, and I am here today again with Chris Skidmore. And we, Chris and I have now had, um, I guess, a total of three conversations on video, and they've all been amazing, <laughs> to say the least. So Chris and I are back because uh, we both want to have another conversation with all of you. And also because we are going to be offering a workshop in October 2023, which we're going to describe to you a little more later in this video. Um, and also because Chris is going to be part of the Infinite Soul Wisdom Astrology 101 course that I'm holding starting in February 2024. And we can talk a little more about that toward the end of this video too. Um, but what is really alive in a lot of the conversations we've been having recently and also is very alive in the astrology right now, and it's specifically in the eclipses coming up, is the theme of... Um, revisioning and healing and coming into a new form of having of relating between the feminine and the masculine and so again we'll say more about what this workshop is going to be coming up in october but one of the big themes of that workshop is the big theme of the workshop is the space that this eclipse season is holding for us to really transform our relationship to the feminine and the masculine and so we want to we want to go into a little mini version of a conversation around that um in this video and and then describe more of what we're going to be doing in that workshop but anyway here we are <laughs> so many my brain is going in so many different directions because there's <laughs> so many ways that this whole topic is important to me and um, but when I really drop into myself, Chris, what what I'm mainly feeling in this time and with this eclipse eclipse season and with the the nodes of the moon being in Aries and Libra now and for the next, you know, another 17 months or so is especially with Pluto squaring those nodes, <clears throat> I feel in myself and I feel in the world an opportunity and I would say even an imperative that we do this differently, that we like, mm. I want to do this thing between the feminine and the masculine in a new way. I really deeply do. And so I'm having my own internal transformation with that. Mm. Um, and I feel like what you and I are wanting to do in this workshop together and even in this conversation together is really for me about holding space for ourselves individually and collectively to do it right to mm. do something differently mm. um which, which again for me is is feeling really really important so i will open it with that but and i'm wondering what's alive for you as i say those things and what's feeling important to you yeah well as powerful opening so i just want to um i just want to comment that yeah i can really feel the depth of your inquiry and and what's coming up for you and I, i'm excited to um you know knowing of what's going on in the background for you of what you're exploring around these particular energies and what what is actually transforming before our eyes in a way because i mean that's one of the things about this it's so mind-bogglingly complex um the topic right we're talking about something that you can simplify into just a few words but it will never be held by just those few words because we're actually in the realm of of i mean just to understand one or the other of masculine and feminine is a mind-boggling uh ex experience and uh, you know we'll never get there kind of thing and then to put them together adds more complexity again um so i just want to sort of open with the the magnitude of it and then come into the um yeah the feeling of when i hear you talking about it and knowing the process you're going through in the background and knowing what is kind of occurring for you um and feeling the passion that you have around it for yourself you know i really appreciate you martha in the way that you 
um, you teach, you, you, you're a teacher, but you're in the inquiry, you know, rather than a, a lot of teachers may be in the transmission of knowing something, uh, really get the sense of the inquiry that you're in, which is why you bring so much to the interviews that you have, because there's a deep seated soul curiosity. Um, so I want to start there just to be like what I'm sensing and picking up from what you're bringing to the table here today. And then, um, and then, yeah, well, before getting on the video, there's been ants around. Um, and <laughs> so I'm going to go on a little ant tangent uh, because, <laughs> you know, because one of the things as we kind of like are in Virgo season, but preparing for this, um, preparing for our, our eclipse workshop um there's a there's a story within a story in the story of psyche and eros which we will explore in our workshop and um you know basically she's she's lost eros he's he's felt betrayed by her and she's and he's flown away and he's feeling injured and she's spilt some of the oil from a hot oil lamp on him and he and he feels injured by that and so he's flown up and flown away um and her whole kingdom, her whole, uh, I guess I would still call it quite Taurian experience of having this big um, palace uh, delivering all of her needs to her and her wants collapses. And so she's in the rubble of it all. And she doesn't know what to do, you know. And um, she's pretty lost and confused so she throws her body into the river thinking that maybe she'll just like end this thing but the river doesn't accept her body and washes her up at the shore and at the shore is the great god pan the half god half man pan who's just playing his pipes and things and he just holds this space for her and goes like what's happened to you why why did you throw yourself in this river you know what's going on she's like oh my god i've lost i've lost love and he says, well, you should really find Eros. That's what he says to her. You should really go find Eros. And she's like, oh, my God. She's like, okay, I get it. So Pan sort of is this elder figure, that this nature spirit that actually just says to him, I don't even know if he knows what he was saying, you know, like he's saying, you know, find Eros. But, of course, it's literally Eros that has been <laughs> <laughs> missing. <laughs> This beautiful moment, and there's actually some beautiful art around that. There's, uh, I think it's Edward Byrne Jones, where Pan and Psyche are, are there with each other. It's a beautiful, beautiful image, one to really go back to of when we're feeling at our lowest, when we're feeling almost like in that suicidal realm, you know, like we want, we want the earth to swallow us up and to just disappear because it's too much. We can't take this amount of loss. And then we need someone like Pan, and we're we're fortunate if we can get somebody like Pan who who holds earthly wisdom and uh, can just hear us and repeat back something that we we know is true. You know, the ants come into this story because then she goes, "Yeah, I need to find Eros," and the only way she can come up with that is to go through Eros's mother Aphrodite, which is like the last thing she wants to do. That's mm -hmm. the one who's her enemy after all, right? Because she's Aphrodite is basically. Um, you know, intimidated by Psyche in some ways. She's the most beautiful human on the earth and it's Aphrodite's role to be beauty. And so that's the the initial tension between the two of them anyway. And if we fast forward a little, Aphrodite gives her four tasks and the first task is the one that involves the ants. And um, and sometimes I go back to this image because it's kind of what we're trying to do even, even now when we're trying to get down to like, what are we trying to talk about with masculine and feminine dynamics and all of these sorts of things um, the first task that Aphrodite gives to Psyche is she puts a big pile of seeds down on the ground, like poppy seeds, millet, and all these different ones. There's like maybe eight or nine different, different seeds there, massive pile on the ground. And she, and she says, I'm off to a banquet now. You separate those seeds out into their different separate piles by sunset. Mm -hmm. Right. So you can imagine the mind going like, oh, like it's psyche, you know, going like, ah, oh, and we can imagine ourselves starting to pick one seed at a time out of a massive mountain of seeds and trying to get them into their different parts, right? This sifting and sorting sort of thing. And this is often the case when we get an overwhelm or a, uh, or a shutdown 
or whatever it might be, you know, like too many different emotions have hit us all at the same time. And we have this huge pile of seeds and we can't sort it out. We don't know what is, what is the pain? What is the betrayal? What is from my past? What is from the present? What is from my soul? What is from my family? We can't do it. Right. And it ends up being this massive pile. And, you know, the shadow side of Virgo would try to actually sift through the pile one at a time and pick out oh, which one is this. I'll put it in that pile. You know, like you're never going to be able to do it, you know, and Psyche is wiser than this. So she sort of collapses to the ground and, and gives up in a way. She, she knows she can't do it and she knows she has to get back to Eros. And so that's her dilemma. And in her sorrow, an aunt arrives on the scene and asks her what's, the problem what's happened and she says you know this is my situation i have this big pile of seeds and there's no way that i can do it and the ants like actually that's pretty easy for us <laughs> <laughs> so you just relax and let the ants do the work mm -mm -mm. and i i i love this image because now we're now the animal kingdom is always the instinctual world right and it's pan that we found before the instinctual world. And it's like, yeah, you can't do this task. It's the truth. Your conscious self, your ego self, your mind has no chance with these seeds, you know, but the instinctual self and the animal self and the wisdom of something in the background of you, maybe we could call it the unconscious or subconscious, or we could talk, call it the, whatever we want to name that. If we just relax back into it, then the sifting and sorting actually happens quite on its own, you know, and those ants, as the, as this, this ant says, it's like, it's no problem for us. So I find those ants to be Virgo, like the high level Virgo is to say like, ah, oh, my body, my soul will sort this out over time. I need to relax into that. And the shadow side of Virgo will be like, damn, that's a lot of seeds. Let me get to it right away, <laughs> you know, and start sifting, sorting, sifting, sorting, and go mad with that, you know, just go absolutely, yeah. So that story came up with the ant on my water bottle, and then the ant is still crawling around my computer here because, you know, I'm in Bali. That's what happens. Um, and... Maybe it's a little taster of like what we're kind of attempting here when we get into such deep, complex topics as masculine, feminine, and how to talk about them in ways that are very practical and easy to understand and to relate to everybody's own life, but not lose the complexity of this thing that we're talking about that can never be reduced uh, into just a few concepts or a few words. Like that's a betrayal of the soul to try to do that, to oversimplify. And of course, the over complication is the other side of that spectrum that we don't want to fall into so i believe that what we're up to you and i with this workshop is to is to is to open a space um funnily enough a space is opening anyway we're just joining in the cosmic opening of the space through the eclipse season uh in which these things that are obviously implicated in the astrology of the times can be more deeply sat with over that two week period um, and for people to join us to do that, to do some deep dreaming about this. And hopefully, I would say pretty clearly, we get a bit more soul, a bit more of a soulful exploration available um, from the experience. Yes. And actually your ant story, which I love, um, is it, I'm, I'm being drawn into, okay, so if we're going to relax into letting the ants do the sorting, What's coming to me also is, you know, yes, I do have this passion, right? I, I really want, and I think a lot of us feel this, I really do want this healing to happen between the feminine and the masculine. So maybe that's my South Node in Aries and my Venus in Aries saying, let me do something with this, right? <laughs> and then, and then, so I begin to describe this, the way we're setting up this workshop, because I think it's so beautifully actually about letting go into in a sense the arms of the cosmos the arms of the the ants of the eclipses this is getting a little weird this metaphor. 
go with it. But it's all yeah. true. It's all true. <laughs> um, so <laughs> maybe you get what I'm saying, but I'll just yeah. describe it a little bit for other people who maybe don't get what I'm saying. So what we are doing in this these two workshops is that we are designing it so that we're going to be meeting two times. And they're both both times that we meet live will also be recorded. And we're going to be meeting on the days of the actual two eclipses. So for people in um, the Americas and Europe, this will be on, well, Europe, it'll be the middle of your night. <laughs> Sorry, in the Americas, it'll be the evening of October 14th and um, October 28th. Those are Saturdays. And for those of you in Australia, etc., it'll be the morning of the October 15th and 29th or Bali or wherever you are in the world and that part of the world. Um, so it'll be in the moment of the actual two eclipses. And, and what we're going to be doing is exploring largely through experiential um, led visualizations, et cetera, our own relationship to our inner feminine and masculine. And then we're all, then we're going to bring in, Chris is going to bring in the mythology of two sets of that inner feminine masculine that can help us explore our own inner feminine masculine. We're going to, we're going to bring in Venus and Mars, and we're also going to bring in Eros and Psyche, right? But what I think is so beautiful and cool about this is that the energetic of eclipses to me really is similar to those ants it really is <laughs> it's like the cosmos is doing a dance and we in our my maybe my well-intentioned aries energy wants to be the thing to be doing something but what's so cool about the container of this two two workshops is that we're setting it up so we're essentially holding we're holding a space in concert with the holding space of the eclipses themselves, right? And so it's this, the feeling I get about these workshops is that we're going to be, you and I will be holding space for all of us to really fall back into the arms of the eclipses and to let mm. the eclipses do this transformative work that is possible in us going more deeply into finding our own inner feminine and masculine and exploring the different some different shades of who we are as feminine and masculine internally through the venus and mars and the Ser eros and the psyche um and then also feeling that there's going to be pluto squaring those nodes right so squaring those eclipses so it's a deeply transformative even i mean all eclipses are transformative but these eclipses are extra extra mega transformative with pluto squaring the nodes and, and so i feel in that just energetically like this this um extra potential to lean back into the the arms of the eclipses and even let pluto do its transformative work with us mm. over that two period two week period mm. was that all computing <laughs> completely yeah yeah very well put very well put. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, so yeah, I feel like we can give a little more detail of the actual Virgo side of what these workshops are going to look like. But would you like to first just elaborate a little bit on on how you see the energetic of these this eclipse season coming up and anything that feels alive or important to say about the potential yeah i mean you know it's interesting because we had this idea to do the um the original idea was actually around you know psyche and eros and and that story and maybe going through those four tasks and you know that was the that was the concept and then when the eclipses came in to the field as as where to do that exploration it was like click 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 because of course we're in the middle of a three-year period where um mars and venus led Mars, the the Mars and Venus opposition as rulers of the signs starting you know given that the the uh, nodes are always going backwards so we actually were in um the Taurus 
the the Taurus Scorpio side of this for the last 18 months. Now we transition only a month ago into the Aries Libra, uh, which is very exciting because then you get one side of the, the Mars Venus opposition and then the other side. And of course, who's the other ruler that lurks in the background of all that, but Pluto, you know, because Pluto is also the co-ruler of Scorpio. So we have this real, as you said, like, I like this uh, expression that you used in concert. Yeah. In concert with the rhythms that are already happening. Um, and it's sort of, once we started to look at, uh, at these eclipses, it, it just became really clear because the, the first one will be purely Libra Aries. And the second one, the full moon will actually be, um, it, it'll be the, the Scorpio Taurus. So we, we, we are going to be dancing in between these two, which, ultimately you know from libra into to scorpio is like the entrance to the underworld right like we we go in through libra and then we go down through scorpio um and you know so we and then we have even just that dance between taurus and and aries even just those two next to each other we also have the 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 classical um venus mars dynamic playing in between there so we have like a cross opening up, don't we? About about the the a deeper dive, and so when we bring in the the Mars Venus, which which astrologically we can find Aphrodite and Era um, and Ares, you know, the goddess of beauty and the god of war. I mean, just that in itself, you know, like how how love and war um, interact with each other is a is a very interesting sort of set of motifs. But then in the deeper layer, we can explore Psyche, who was basically declared in the second century as new Venus. You know, there was this sense of her coming up as as a beautiful maiden, um, earth-born figure who then as ascends from the earthliness to the divine. Um, that's her journey from, from the earth realm to the divine. At the same time as we had a different story coming up at that same time about Christ, who was coming from the upper world and then descending into the earthly realm. So I actually see those two as, as two stories that were operating at the same moment. Um, the psyche, the psyche story got a bit lost in the haze of things over the next few thousand years, but she was trying to emerge out of the earth into the divine and the masculine was trying to descend out of the divine into the earth, um, which mm. those two stories very clearly speak to both of them being dreamed at the same time right and so i think that's that's a point of like i always like to ask if especially in times of great confusion which i believe that we're in like when did we last have a sense of this then you know when did, when did we last get it because that's like walking the labyrinth right the reason you have the thread when you walk the labyrinth is that you can get lost in the labyrinth because you have the thread and the question you ask when you pull back on the thread is like when did I last know where I was? When did I last know where I was? What was that bad choice that I made? And maybe for us, it's like, hmm, we might have done something around that second, third, fourth century AD where we just kind of like made a decision that the feminine wasn't really worth getting into as much as this whole, oh my God, God's come down from the heavens. That's the real story. But that's a half story. And that half story has had a had a lot of impact over a few thousand years, in my opinion. And that's the pretty easy to see if we have a look around. It became lopsided, but the answer to lopsidedness is not to just lop side the other way, right? Not to lop the other side off. And so my passion in all of this is, you know, 20 years ago, I wanted to write a book about the Australian male. It was going to be called Stag Nation. Um, and I had it all set in my mind of what I was going to do, but it just remained in idea form. I never acted it out, but it's always been in my mind of, you know, what is the state of, of the masculine men and boys in this world? It's a very topic that's very dear to me. And I think it gets largely misunderstood because I think these boys are in these boys and these men are in extraordinary amounts of pain, pain that they play out through the world. So I look for ways that I can speak into that as much as possible, um, you know, to try to offer some kind of a healing balm, um, through conversation and, and words can be, words can be just that. Right. And so 
part of the exploration I think we're we're looking to do together is to is to discover um the beauty of both sides of this and to really represent both sides of this so that we can see, yeah, there's flaws in the masculine and beautiful parts of the masculine. There's flaws in the feminine and beautiful parts of the masculine of the feminine. And I think if we can we can allow ourselves to be with those things, um, <clears throat> then the possibility opens up, as you say, of the third thing, which is the connection of the both, you know, which, um, which is Eros, but not in the form of his personified self, but more in the form of the original, you know, at, at the start of creation in the Greek creation myth, there's five uh, elements that, that open up. And Eros is one of those elements before even Gaia was there. Mm -hmm. Um, so the reason that's so important is like, how can you have creation without the mingling of parts? Like things have to come together to create something new. Um, and so Eros is in, is implied at the very heart of creation, isn't it? If Eros stops, all life stops pretty quickly. Um, and that is like, well, how do these, how do these forces interact? Sometimes they get into such such tension with each other that it becomes almost unresolvable but sometimes they have such a you know such a dance with each other that it creates and creates and creates right so this sort of like creation destruction that can happen over that that one simple idea of of eros the one fairly simple idea is an extraordinary complex uh thing that we try yeah. to explore yeah and something, you know, we had a lot of back and forth conversation, dreaming into what this workshop is yeah. meant, all of that. And I think one of the sentences you said in that conversation that feels so key, I don't remember your exact words, but essentially it's that um, we have the the potential to repeat cycles right? Mm. Mm. Or we have the potential to do this differently. Mm. So for me, an eclipse, it's like an eclipse season, one of the things I feel it doing or having the potential to be doing for us energetically is that instead of, you know, going around in a circle over and over and over again, just repeating and creating a rut, <laughs> mm. um, I feel energetically the 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 event of an eclipse is like it's it has the potential to help us go into a spiral right instead mm. of repeating a circle mm. so so in these eclipses specifically um given that the nodes are in aries libra and pluto's squaring the nodes and all of what we're just talking about i feel like like energetically we we can like jump up a notch in terms of our our way of meeting these energies right like so we don't mm. just keep doing the the venus aries libra i mean oh my god venus mars <laughs> libra aries circle <clears throat> over and over again of you yeah. know budding or whatever it is that maybe our yeah. world has been doing we don't want that i don't think mm. any of us want that mm. <laughs> anymore please yeah stop yeah it's not so fun no <laughs> and and um okay so then what so i think i feel like energetically one of the opportunities of this eclipse these eclipses is to help us bump out of that circle to create the spiral mm. right and and i feel like part of what we're we're doing and what you're saying is that um as we dive into these archetypes and as we explore different variations of them um, and different nuances of each of them, that is part of what can help us to find new pathways um, mm. to evolve as opposed to just cycle. <clears throat> exactly. And, and, you know, like, uh, like Jung talks about the, the alchemical process is, uh, is basically the three phases separate, purify, integrate. 
right? Mm. So if we come back to the ants, we can't do much if it's in a big pile. If there's a huge pile of unprocessed, unprocessable uh, trauma, pain, hurt, you did this to me, I did this to you, you know, this whole kind of thing, then it just remains a big pile of damaged, you know, sort of nothing you can do. So, and if you try to purify that or integrate that, no, that's why this is the first task of psyche. It's actually to separate it out into like, you know, whether that's separating out your emotions and your feelings or, or the things that have happened or all of these kinds of things, but to, but to allow the separation to happen first, mm. purification comes next integration comes after that mm. right sometimes we try to integrate things that are not actually available for integration right now because you haven't separated them out yet you haven't got them yeah. clear from each other so then if you try to integrate they'll just be merged into the mess right they'll just be merged into that you just be trying to integrate something that's not actually yet integratable and yeah. so it's an interesting dance, isn't it? Because we are going to separate out the energies of masculine and feminine here. And some people might be like, well, come on guys, just go straight to the integration of that. Let's go, let's go straight to Eros on this and let's start to bring that all together now. <laughs> like, well, the reality of it is that you actually do need to separate out. So you don't even know these, this polarity that you're working in. <clears throat> and the purification is the process that we'll be talking about where like, let's really allow these signs to just be totally on their own, separate from each other, and really understand what is, in this case, let's say Aries energy and what is Libra energy. Let's just get that clear. And that purification gets them back to something more essential. And then the essences of those two, well, just like the myths, Mars and Venus couldn't keep their hands off each other. They would meet anywhere and any time. There's a lot of attraction between the two forces, you know? So there's a natural way that those two will come together, but in their more toxic forms, they'll just create toxicity, right? Together. Yeah. And another key thing that you, you've you said in this video and you've said before we were recording is I, I, I think that, um, yeah, we've been really focused on in particular with the masculine energies, more of the, ugly side i guess you could say and and what i'm feeling called to in my own life in my own self and and in the world is hey hang on a second there is so much beauty and yes in the feminine but in the masculine excuse me yeah. <laughs> you know um and i meant to say on really briefly on a personal level i the last conversation that you and i had together was following up on um, the symposium that I held and, and the kind of mm, difficult or even traumatic experiences I had with the divine masculine week. And we had a really beautiful mm. conversation with that on that video. And then what has been happening for me, again, this is just a super brief version of it, but I, I feel like that whole chapter of my life of, of preparing for the this symposium and then doing the symposium happened right after my dad died last December. And mm. I feel like the six months from December of 2022 to June of 2023, when I completed that symposium were really in lots of different ways about me. Again, just being transparent here personally, but we're really about me um, completing a cycle with my own karma with what I would call is the, the wounded masculine for, I don't know what word to use for that, but you know, something along those lines, right? Not that it no longer exists in me or in my world or any of that, but it's, it's like my dad represented a lot of that. A lot of that, I would say wounded masculine came out in the symposium and it, and it was a time from where I was able to kind of wrap up my relationship with it. And then what has transpired since then is it became so clear in my own world, in my own life, in my own childhood, 
that 99% of my experience with the masculine is actually unbelievably powerfully positive. Both of my grandfathers, my uncle, cousins, I mean, just boom, it all came rushing forward into my consciousness. Like, Mm. whoa, (laughs) you know, yes, I had, I had a dad who had a difficult (laughs) sides to him, but actually the vast majority of my experience with the masculine is incredibly beautiful, Mm. incredibly positive, so supportive, unconditionally loving of me on every level. Um, and my own inner masculine is actually very, very beautiful and very positive. Mm. Whoa. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And that's amazing. And so what I'm feeling called into now, and, and I think it's, probably somewhat of a collective calling or opportunity also is yes really really easy to see and get caught up in the toxic masculine the blah blah you know we can turn on the news and instantaneously there it is Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I I don't feel like you know we're done dealing with that clearly we're not yet at the same time I feel like the North node being in Aries is partly about us being um, shown, like being focused on, oh, wait a second. No, there's beauty here. There's so much beauty right in front of me and inside Mm -hmm. of me. That is the beautiful positive masculine too. And I need, I feel like I'm wanting to uh, meet that right. Mm -hmm. Fully 100% all of me completely Mm -hmm straight face on Mm. Um, that's where i am in my own journey yeah and and i think it's just such a an important reflection to to just to just be able to say that and to see that 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 this particular energy for starters like these are the children of necessity to borrow from hillman's terms there right like there is the goddess necessity but it's like the children of necessity as far as these are the energies that we have in this place we can't just be done with it or move away from it or you know kind of like get us out of this and aries is an energy that is ruled by the god of war mars and so we so of course there was going to be there was always going to be a struggle and there always has been a struggle with this particular kind of energy because the shadow side of it can be extraordinarily destructive and obvious, like out there in the world, obvious of what the destructive capacity of that is. But also when we go into the destructive side of the other side of the equation, you know, like the 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 Venus side of that equation, that's also incredibly destructive, but maybe less visible maybe less easy to sort of like pick out and say, well, well, this is happening in the world, right? And so in order to to see kind of the beauty of both sides, we also have to be able to explore the shadow of both sides. And then it becomes like, oh, the problem with Venus isn't Mars. The problem with Venus is Venus. That's where <laughs> Venus gets most of her problems from. And the problem with Mars is Mars. That's where Mars gets most of his problems from which is that second phase of alchemy, right? Purify that, accept Mm -hmm. that, that within yourself, this is that. Like, what's the hardest thing for a human being to understand about themselves? I'm violent. Like I have violence inside of myself and I would rather be seen as or feel within my world that I am peaceful, loving, harmonious, kind, caring, all of the different things. That's what I want to be seen as. And it's very confronting to say that there's violence within me. But of course there is. There is violence, you know? And I think being able to, that's the work of purification. Because if we can't be with the shadow side of it, we're not doing purification, right? We're doing something else. We're we're trying to paint a pretty picture. But the prettiest pictures are ones that actually go deep. They take you in to the complexity of it all and take you take you really into it. And I think it's, you know, you can't just take the shadow side of one side of this and, and paint that as the whole, which is why, you know, one of the things you said, you know, the word toxic and the word masculinity shouldn't be coupled together. Toxic can go with anything. You know, there can be toxic anything, right? And I think the two 
getting coupled together is a, is really bad for both the masculine and the feminine. I think it's bad for the bad for the world. And so I think part of the mythic layer of this is to help purify that, help separate that out, help clarify that like, yeah, toxic can go with anything, you know. There's definitely toxic femininity in the world too, and 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 toxic anything. It's not like things go bad, things go off sometimes, right? This allows us to get to get deeper into what are we really talking about here, and how can we how can we acknowledge this sign? Yes, the shadow of it is pretty extreme, or can be pretty extreme with the violence that can come from the god of war. But also, we don't want a world without this energy. We actually don't want that kind of a world. We need we need to fall back in love with Aries energy and fall back in love with Mars energy and therefore fall back in love with masculinity and therefore fall back in love with men. Mm -hmm. You know? Fall back in love with men. And women. Um, but yes. <clears throat> yeah. Of course. You know, of course. And But that side of it, I think, is like, there's a beauty in that because it leaves a lot more room. Um, like when one side is doing the work, right? It leaves a lot more room for the other side. And that's why I'm always inspired by these men's circles and women's circles because it's like, great. And then the thing that happens in the middle, well, that's what we'll discuss as far as Eros because that's the dance in between. And it's not Eros is not about how our modern world thinks of like the world erotic. It's like a sexualized thing. And sex is a part of it, but it's a smaller part of it than what we're talking about here. We're talking about the greater, <clears throat> the greater glue that connects these two forces. You know, always drawn to each other, always have been, always will be these two forces. And the dance that they can create and the magic and the 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 beauty that gets created out of that. Yeah, yeah, it's the dance of creation itself, isn't it? Ultimately, and that's the third phase of integration. Yeah yeah and it seems like like one of the overall themes is to yeah to not deny any of it to not deny the shadow to not deny the beauty to you know again i feel i feel pluto squaring those nodes just to go deep into the reality meet the reality of all of it whatever happens to be alive right there in us in the world in this moment and then to hold it in you know the potential that there that is there for us to to meet it in maybe a new way um yeah and also way. clocking that eris <clears throat> eris is involved in all of this too right the the goddess of discord and and she is uh Oh yeah, <laughs> You're very much involved in these eclipses. Yes, she is. She's right on the north node. <clears throat> right on the north node. So, <clears throat> you know, she's the one not invited to the party, right? Because her name means strife, and she's the sister of Ma. She's the sister of Ares, Ares and Ares and Eros. You know, all these sort of sounds, and they're all they all have their own form of this. But you know, Eris, the goddess of discord and strife. So of course, nobody wants them at the party. You know, like, of course, you don't want to invite er Eris in. And yet, by not inviting Eris in, it leads to the Trojan War. You know, some very much bigger disaster happens from the decision not to not to invite that part into the banquet. And I think that's what you're talking about. It's like, yeah, to invite that in is going to cause some discord in here and might shake things up a bit, which could be uncomfortable. Um, but not as uncomfortable as we keep Eris out you know yeah and then she, um, yeah well it's, it's a completely other conversation but just to add in on the south nodes we're gonna have eris on the north node we'll have persephone and lilith the asteroid on the south node <laughs> oh wow okay wow <laughs> <laughs> all squaring pluto yep <laughs> oh god okay mm -hmm. yeah so you know i mean this is underworld so if we if we can't um yeah, we we it's a call, isn't it? It's a call to say like let's go in to the yeah. to the things that are that are causing discomfort or even discord. And by embracing that we give more room. You know, again, why I go back to the Greeks and their mythology is that 
is that everybody is flawed um, in Greek mythology. And it's very relaxing for my psyche to, to think of multiple flawed gods trying to figure it out between themselves. Because that's, that's life, right? We're multiple flawed humans trying to figure it out with each other. Yeah. And we would like to go into relationship through the Libran side of the equation and, and just be in peace, harmony, and love. Right. That's and, what we'd like. Yes. And in a different context, you were before we were recording, you brought up this reality that sometimes there's a fake Libra, right? Yeah. Mm. So we have the south node in Libra with <clears throat> so squaring the nodes. And in the evolutionary astrology way of doing things, the south node is the resolution node. So it's so it's actually the south node in Libra that we maybe theoretically want to be going deeply into. Um and we don't, and we want to maybe go through different layers of Libra. We don't want to stay with a fake Libra. That mm. sucks. <laughs> we don't want yeah. to just pretend to be getting along, right? That's yeah. No, 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 because no. that will explode <laughs> after mm-hmm. a while. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it'll explode into its opposite. It'll explode into war. Yeah. And that's the reality of things. And so we get past the fake Libra. We go into sort of a declaration of war and and love does sometimes turn to war which is some which is part of this exploration too yeah yeah so, so we lo- break down the fake libra then we can get to something more deep and real like true harmony and balance um because it is those scales yeah and and i would say even the south node in libra ha- has the potential to have fake beauty and fake, fake mm. harmony right mm. right so it's like so we don't want to just label whatever it is mars or or venus or whatever as oh that's beautiful i'm going to fall in love with the masculine now and Mm. cover up my feelings of (laughs) discomfort or whatever that's not what we want either (laughs) no yeah um yeah so many layers so many layers so much more things that come up but i think that gives a good taste into yeah. what we're what we're up to, what we're what we're attempting here, what we're moving towards. Exactly. Yeah. On a practical Virgo level, <laughs> I could yep. just name um, you know, so again, so we're gonna be holding two separate, well, two interconnected <laughs> workshops um that are joined as one on each of the days of the eclipses. And in those workshops, we're gonna do a combination of um diving deep into finding your own inner your own genuine inner feminine masculine just whatever that happens to be that's going to be number one that's not going to be attached to any any kind of archetype it'll just be whatever is true and present for you and then we're going to go we're go more deeply into the the energetics of what is alive in these eclipses and we'll go into the mythology associated with Aries, well, Mars, Venus, and then Eros and Psyche kind of, we've given a taste of what that's about. Um, but we'll go more deeply into how can, you know, whatever it is that you feel or find in yourself, in your own inner feminine and masculine relationship, how can the energetics of these eclipses really hold the space for you to go more dive more deeply into meeting them wherever they happen to be. And is there a gift in, in the archetypes of Mars, Venus, Eros, and or psyche that can help you to, to give your inner feminine masculine relationship, whatever it happens to be needing in this time. And, and, you know, instead of doing the circle, take it into the spiral, whatever that mm. happens to be for you. And then also hopefully this spirals out into the, into the cosmos and into the collective too. But it's yeah, really focused on your own personal journey with this inner feminine and masculine and the potential mm. healing and transformation in this eclipse time. Mm. Sounds I'll amazing. I'm in, I would be in. <laughs> You want to you want to be there? <laughs> yeah, I'll I want to be there. Okay, good. <laughs> I want to take this now. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Awesome. Um, 
Great. And then I'll just give one tiny little uh, taster also for everybody. <laughs> a lot of a lot of you have already signed up for uh, the the Infinite Soul Wisdom Astrology 101 course, which is starting in February of 2024. It's already a bunch of you signed up. It's super exciting. And um, part of what you all have actually mentioned to me as part of the reason you're signing up is because Chris <laughs> is going to be a pretty integral part of that course. And, you know, it's going to be a course held by me, but Chris is going to be doing a monthly fireside chat where Chris is going to be diving deeply into the mythology of whatever uh, sign and planets we happen to be focusing on in that month. And um, we haven't like fleshed out every tiny detail, but is there anything briefly you feel called to say about that, Chris, and your role and your hope for your role in all of it? Yeah, so well, people... I mean, I'm really excited at, at the opportunity to to explore within the container that you already have set up, right? So I feel like I have a a room in the house, <clears throat> you know, my room in that house where it's all mm -hmm. decorated with my Greek gods and goddesses and you know, all my figures that I brought back from Delphi and they'll, they'll just be around and a little fire will be going, the hearth will be there, you know. And <clears throat> in that room, we get to just really explore um, mythic layers and undertones to all of these uh, figures that are obviously the myths that are, the myths are implied, but the myths are the uh, usually with astrologers, the myths are, are barely known or known only very briefly or just the surface layer, like, oh, Mars is this and Venus is that, like a line or two about these characters. And so what I like to do is to put the, to, to bring them back to life and to have them interact with each other um, because that's what they do. They, they're not static, these things. They're, they're interactive. Um, and so the myths help us because, you know, like all, good polytheism and the Greeks were masters at it. Um, they all have their own things that they want to get done, but they all have to meet the others and go through whatever they have to go through with each other. And that's the same for our inner life because we all have multiple parts that want different things. And then they have to interact with each other and sometimes get along and sometimes not get along. And it happens in the world, in our dynamics and our interactions. And it happens in the greater world in like the big, um, political dramas that play out in the world. And all, and we can infer then that it happens in the cosmos. And so the, the mythological way of approaching things just helps us to plant little seeds every now and again. There's just one or two lines that you hear and it'll repeat around or you'll, you'll sort of mull over a story sometimes for years and years as it, as it turns out, you know, and that will slowly inform your astrology and your psychology and your inner work and your outer work and the whole thing, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a profound extra layer that we get to go into, <clears throat> but because it's not going to be my course, I get to really, really enjoy the space that you'll be holding around that. Um, mm -hmm. And just to be able to really go in with whoever's with us um, where we can all just take it to that extra dimension and extra layer. And I just, I think it'll be just really fun beyond yeah. anything else, you know, just be really enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. And I can just contextualize really briefly that. So, so I, when I, I got shown by the spirit world to, to hold this course, first of all, and I got shown very specifically who the guest speakers were meant to be and their role. And so, you know, the other guest speakers are um, Heather Ensworth, Kelly Hunter, and Julia Balaz and potentially one other amazing human. Um, but then, and and those three are going to be doing one guest appearance essentially through the year. Um, but it was shown to me so clearly that you, Chris, were meant to do this monthly regular appearance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and the way, you know, I can go into this deep, more deeply in another video, but really the way I see it is that this, the course is meant to be a portal of remember, like a sacred portal of remembering our own relationships to the cosmos, to the earth and, um, and to these archetypes and these energies. And, and you bring something that I just do not have. I don't mm -hmm. have, you have, my experience of you is that you have this deeply sacred, and I would say 
probably pretty ancient relationship to these particular myths to the greek um we're going to be doing another conversation another time about your relationship to even the greek the the ancient sites in greece Mm. itself but Mm. uh you know there's something really really beautiful about your relationship to these stories that has totally changed my perspective on them and i Mm. think in a lot of um my astrological circles there can be a, like a looking down on the greek mm. and roman mythology because it's based in patriarchy right and i i acknowledge that and i i respect that perspective and when i met you it was like the light bulbs all turned on <laughs> all mm. at once and i went wait a second no 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 this is an ancient sacred tradition for real mm. Mm. true right and i feel mm-hmm. like you are tapped into that reality um in a way that i i know very few people i don't actually i don't know anyone else who has it in the way that you do and so that i feel like that's what this when the spirit world is showing me that you need to be doing this as a regular person in the course mm. and i can't speak for them <laughs> but that's my sense of that you bring like really deep beauty and sacredness with these stories um, in a way that I, I, I just don't have that. And mm. I, do. I, I would, I would say, <clears throat> well, thank you for that. <clears throat> I would say that um, particularly the Greeks in the classical period had what I would call a triumph of the imagination. And I think it's a, it's an era as modern as to project back patriarchy onto that time. Um, because I think it was very, there wasn't one central thing happening in that time. And ancient Greece was several small pockets of places, the maximum amount, any polis, which is what they called a city, the polis, which we obviously still have in our language now, the metropolis and everything. So a polis was a maximum of 50,000 people. Athens was a maximum of 50,000 people. Mm-hmm. And so there wasn't some central controlling thing. And that's what makes Greek Greece so triumphant in that, you know, you go to this place and now this is a, the cult of Aphrodite is here. And this place is like, oh, this is a Chiron place. And this place is like the the northerners. We don't really know much about that, but we got the the wild centaur sort of feeling, you know, because of all these invasions that happen and things. And so there's this sense of a, a mythic landscape, actually. So to project modern ideas onto that, I think, is an error. Um, and Greeks, ancient Greece was flawed. I no question about that. Um, however, some of the triumphs of the imagination, some of the old plays that we still go back to today, um, the the reverence for the arts, an incredibly interactive mythology, interactive you know, that's what gave rise to the Eleusinian mysteries and, you know, the cult of Asclepius and these things that come all the way down to our modern day. And to me, it's like really, really going back and sitting in that place and taking out my modern judgment of them has just has allowed me to then see, yeah, I mean, I can't say that these myths themselves are patriarchal or leaning one way or the other. They sometimes do and sometimes don't. Um But ultimately, there's too many revered goddesses to call it patriarchy. Athens is named after Athena, who's a goddess, right? Like, so as far as reverence for the, for the feminine in their mythology is very clearly there, very clearly there from what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so much there to be explored and we will. (laughs) And we will. And I look forward to it. (laughs) Awesome. I can't wait. (laughs) Yeah. Same. Very cool. Anything else you feel called to say before we close <laughs> for now? No, that feels good. I think we've covered covered a lot of the ground. And, you know, I guess coming back to the original moment of those ants, you know, as we're, <laughs> as we're wandering through Virgo season now, most people see this in, in Virgo season. And it's a nice story to sort of, especially with the Pisces side of the Pisces-Virgo axis, Pisces can be the overwhelming emotional state of multiple emotions vying for our attention and ending up in this huge pile of seeds in the middle of the floor. And, um, you know, 
And so if we follow Psyche's lead, we don't try to pick away at that, at those seeds. We actually get back from it a little bit and allow magical help to come in. And um, so, yeah, just bringing it back to that, that image where we started with and, that's the image that I suppose, you know, it will be showing up because we'll be doing the Psyche near us. We'll be talking about Psyche's tasks in our workshop. Um, and that's one of her four tasks. And it's really beautiful, actually quite practical mythological wisdom of uh, of how to, how to get Psyche to get back in touch with Eros in a way, you know, which would be the metaphor of Psyche not in touch with eros is very much up in the head up in the up in the thinking mind over analysis ocd this kind of thing and you connect her back to to eros the body um and she operates in a much more functioning beautiful poetic way and i think that's what the story ultimately offers as a as a centerpiece to psychotherapy given that it is psychotherapy is care of the soul the therapy is the care and the tending to and we're tending to psyche herself you know, so that's ultimately who we're who we're going back to have a look at, and who we're looking to spend some time with, as we go through this masculine and feminine dynamics and everything else we'll be talking about. Beautiful. Many more doors. <laughs> Many doors. <laughs> yep. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all for watching and um, certainly join us for the workshop if that's calling to you. Certainly join us for the Astrology 101 journey, sacred journey next year if that's calling to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Chris, I'll have all of your contact information. Highly recommend Chris's um, podcast and you do one-on-one -on -one work with people, et cetera, right? Yeah. Uh, all of your info will be right. here. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, mother. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. See you in the workshop. See you soon.